Hi everyone. Welcome to this week's Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar, which is the uh, I understand is the last one for the year, and it's an auspicious one because today we have a distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture uh, from Luke Wallace, Tim Ransley, Nadesh Raleigh, and Patrick Dew. Uh, so congratulations to you all for um, receiving your DGAL for this year. Before we start, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we're meeting today and also around Australia for those online, which in Canberra are the Nambri and Ngunnawal people. And I pay my respects to their continuing con connection to the lands, waters and community. And I also pay my respects to the people, cultures and elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Um, today, Wednesday seminar, the DGAL, as I said, is about assessing the status of groundwater in the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, and the presentation today will highlight the outcomes of a three and a bit year study on that particular topic. Um, and the Great Artesian Basin, the reason Geoscience Australia is involved in this work is because the Great Artesian Basin is a national asset, uh, is the largest groundwater basin in Australia and covers more than 22% of our landmass, underlying parts of Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, and the NT. And the Great Australian Basin groundwater is a vital resource for town water supplies, pastoral and agricultural and extractive industries, and sustains unique groundwater dependent ecosystems and supports traditional indigenous values. So the project assessed existing and new geoscientific data and techniques, including satellite data, to improve our understanding of the groundwater system and the water balance of the Great Artesian Basin, which I think is going to be from now on uh, abbreviated to GAB. But don't don't get it confused with the Great Great Australian Bite either, which is also the GAB. Anyway, before we get started, all right, a little bit about the speakers. Um, so Nadez Raleigh, who's on the stage with me here, is a senior geoscientist at Geoscience Australia. She studied at the University of Paris at the Pierre and Marie Curie. Uh, uh, area in France, so, um, and graduated with a MSc and a PhD in 1999 in geology and geophysics. And since joining Geoscience Australia, she has contributed to assessments of petroleum prospectivity, seepage studies, CO2 storage, cover mapping, and groundwater systems of Australian sedimentary basins. And Nadej is currently investigating the depositional framework and groundwater systems of the GAB. Uh, next, we have Tim Ransley, who is a hydrogeologist with over 28 years of experience with much of this time has been spent working on scientific investigations of the gap. Tim started his career in 1992 and joining the Bureau of Mineral Resource Resources as a technical officer before moving to the groundwater group of the Bureau of Rural Science. And he joined Geoscience Australia in 2008 and co-authored the Hydrogeology Atlas of the Great Artesian Basin. And online, we also have Luke Wallace, who is a project leader and hydrogeochemist he completed a degree in exploration geology from the University of Tasmania in codes, followed by a PhD in regular geochemistry with the CRC Lean at the Australian National University. His experience includes local, national and international groundwater projects, and he enjoys being part of a multidisciplinary project addressing issues from local to national scales. And also online, we have Patrick Dew, uh, who joined Geoscience Australia as an INSAR scientist in 2021. Uh, Patrick holds an MSc uh, from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD from the University of New South Wales and has experience as a lecturer at the University of Sydney and as a research fellow at the University of New South Wales from 2018 to 2021. And Patrick has published over 25 journal articles, building a promising career in Earth observation, particularly using INSAR data. So that's a little bit about the, uh, the, the presenters today. Uh, they're representing a larger team of people as they'll, as they'll uh, uh, specify in their slides. And I think I'm handing over to Luke, who's online. Is that correct? Thanks, Andrew. Yes. Okay, take it away, Luke. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, so thanks to everyone who's in the room and, and online. Uh, this presentation is summarising the work we've completed for this uh, groundwater project, uh, assessing the status of groundwater in the Great Artesian Basin, uh, which the presenters here are delivering on behalf of the um, greater project team, both within GA um, and our collaborators. So the Great Artesian Basin, or GAB, is Australia's largest hydrological system, covering around a fifth of the continent and supporting um, over 12.8 billion in economic activity annually. Uh, the GAB contains around 
uh, 3,000 artesian bores, um, 30,000 sub-artesian bores, um, and, and 12 major spring groups that support um, the people and the environment. Because of the demand and the reliance on the resource, uh, we need to understand this groundwater system. And this study focuses on a whole basin scale, um, as well as the three major sub-basins of the Carpentaria, um, Aramanga and Surat, um, and brings together multiple disciplines for um, uh, an integrated um, assessment. So while significant research has been undertaken, um, particularly by the jurisdictions, um, there remain hydrological knowledge gaps that impair our ability to manage the groundwater. So partly this impairment's due to the large size of the basin, um, which you can see covers uh, much of Queensland as well as New South Wales, South Australia and NT. Um, and the aim of this project is to assess how um, new giant, um, new geoscientific data and technologies, um, including satellite data, can be used to improve our understanding of the hydrological system and water balance um, across the GAB. So the project is in partnership um, with the relevant uh, Commonwealth and jurisdiction uh, water agencies, um, and these stakeholders are also um, part of the, uh, the GAB project steering committee um, with both policy and science representatives. Um, so I guess our, our key stakeholders are informed and uh, have been able to contribute directly to the project, which we've much appreciated. Um, we haven't gone it alone. Um, we've also collaborated um, with a number of organisations, including the Australian National University, uh, Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO. So this work is also aligned um, with the GAB Strategic Management Plan, um, and in particular, um, Principle 6, uh, but providing um, underpinning information, knowledge and understanding um, for management. So this cross-section of GAB aquifers um, from Queensland on the right through to South Australia on the left um, shows the basin's geological architecture and confined aquifers and aquitards. Um, and as you can see, it's underlain by um, older basins in the red and purple and overlain um, by the Cenozoic in, in the yellow on top. So as you can see, the large size and um, also the complexity of the GAB, um, it's inherently difficult to monitor at this scale. Um, or to manage or even be able to define the water balance. So to understand um, the hydrogeology, the project's focusing on um, some five key components of the hydrogeology, um, the groundwater recharge, um, conceptualizing these, uh, producing a water balance and assessing uh, new tools, including satellite um, data. So in this project, um, we integrate integrate these um, key components to bring together um, the geological bucket that holds the groundwater, hydrogeology, um, how the water enters the system, groundwater recharge, and use these new findings to visualize um, an up, updated conceptualization as well as an updated um, water balance um, and assessing these as well as new techniques um, that can be added to our toolbox. Um, which all contribute to an improved understanding um, of the GAB. And in this presentation, uh, we'll summarise each of these key components. So we'll essentially be going through each of these components um, that you see here one by one, um, and we'll be starting off with the hydrological framework, and I'll hand over to Nadej for that. Thanks, Nadej. Yep, thank you, Luke. So in this uh, component of the work, we focused on updating the hydrogeological architecture of the basin, which means the geometry and characteristics of the aquifers and aquitard. And we did this to address the fact that despite that the geological units that define the aquifers and aquitard are continuous across borders, there remains inconsistencies in nomenclature and correlation of those units across the various water management jurisdictions. And also, as Luke mentioned, due to the size the large size of the basin and its geological complexity, the previous models were a simplification of a complex system. So in this study, we developed a consistent geological framework across the various jurisdictions. We also updated the hydrogeological classification by mapping the internal variability within the aquifers and aquitard. And using this information, we built a new 3D geological model to improve the hydrogeological conceptualization of the GAB. So how did we do this? 
by using a chronostratigraphic integrated workflow where we integrated various data sets at different scale from regional to more detailed local scale, such as airborne electromagnetic data, seismic data, gravity and mag, borehole formation peaks and log correlations, and also solid geology. And we brought all these various data sets in a common platform, in a 3D domain and in depth, and we correlated all these various interpretations by using a chronostratigraphic framework, which means that we correlated time equivalent geological units from the surrounding basins that are calibrated to the geological time scale. We have also linked the geological units to the Australian Stratigraphic Unit Database so we could update the information more efficiently. So doing so, we have a consistent 3D interpretation that that allows us to update the hydrogeological surfaces, but also map major structures and facies distribution that influence the water flow path across the whole basin. And doing so, we can then update the hydrogeological conceptualization for the gap. So, so far we have compiled and collated uh, lots of various data sets, more than thousands of boreholes and stratigraphic peaks we have revised the stratigraphy on hundreds of key boreholes using palynology and geochronological constraints. And we've done this along regional transect across the whole basins and across the various jurisdictions. We have also integrated with accessible seismic data and interpretation and integrated also with the newly acquired airborne electromagnetic data, particularly the data acquired during this project on the eastern margin of the GAB in the northern Surat and eastern Eramanga Basin to help us refine the geometry and characteristics of the intake bed. And you will hear more about it a bit later. So doing so, we've been able to QC all the data, bring all this information in, the, in a standard format, which allowed us to update our geo uh, databases that can then be used by everyone for different purposes. So by correlating the geological units to the geological timescale and also with depths, we were able to map a 3D chronostratigraphic framework that we used to refine the 3D distribution of the aquifers and aquitard across the whole gap. We have also mapped the internal lithological variability within each uh, aquifers and aquitard as a proxy to map potential variability within the aquifers and aquitard that help highlight uh, connectivity within and between the aquifers across the whole basin. And so we could highlight connective lateral or vertical connectivity. So for example, in this uh, main Kanawiure aquifer, you can see that this aquifer is not an aquifer everywhere and groundwater may be compartmentalized in some part of the basin or connected in others. So by bringing all these various data sets at a regional or more local scale, we've been able to build a new 3D geological model with 19 layers from the basement to the ground surface uh, that help, helped us to refine the subdivision of the main aquifers and aquitard. And you can see here highlighted in red that now the Kanawe Ore aquifer is defined by three main surfaces. Uh, I want to highlight as well by building this model, we have created some uncertainty map for each layers that shows the distribution of the input data points and uh, our level of confidence on them, which helped after to highlight where to acquire new data or refine the interpretation to improve the model. So using this model, we can now visualize in 3D the, the aquifer geometry. It helps also to integrate with other data and other disciplines. It's a fantastic, fantastic tool to communicate with all users in the GAB. Uh, it's also a tool that can help us to calculate approximate volumes of aquifers, and we've used it to update the water balance estimates. So from the previous models that uh, shows uh, a smooth and simplified visualization of the hydrogeological units, as you can see here, now with the new model, we have improved the resolution laterally and vertically by adding additional data, data points and also by uh, adding uh, more subdivision in the different units. 
Also, by mapping the internal lithological variability within each unit, we are able to map potential connectivity across the whole gap. So this has implication and it helped us to update the aquifers and aquitar distribution. For example, here you can see an example of the Adoree Springbok aquifer that is now time equivalent to the Aji Bukina sandstone in the Western Eramanga Basin. So you can see now that this aquifer is connected, is uh, extend across all the gap and potentially uh, groundwater is connected up to the western side of the basin. So that this will have implication for water management in, value, in those various jurisdictions. Also by mapping the internal variability, lithological variability within this aquifer, we can map where this um, aquifer may be better connected across the basin. So in summary, to the key outcome of this component, I've seen the development of an updated all of gap cartographic interpretation that uh, now shows a, that is consistent across all the various jurisdictions. This helped us to uh, map potential connectivity across the aquifers within and between the aquifers. We've used it to build a new 3D geological model to refine the geometry, extent and internal variability within the aquifers and aquitard across the various jurisdictions. And we've used this model to update the hydrogeological conceptualization of the GAB, but also to contribute to an updated all of GAB water balance and also to constrain a basin-wide groundwater flow dynamic model that you will hear more in detail a bit later. So now I will hand over to Tim, who will um, describe um, the work done on the groundwater recharge component. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Nadish. Um, so the groundwater recharge work um, had a number of components, including looking at um, remapping the intake beds, um, updating some groundwater recharge estimates, and looking at how water flows from the recharge areas into the basin. So one of the key things uh, as Nadez has alluded to was we did, did the AEM survey across the intake beds. Um, if you look at the map on the right, this shows the magenta lines are the, are the AEM flight lines that were collected as part of the project. Um, we have the eastern Aramanga in the north and the northern Surat Basin. So this, um, the information that we gathered from that really gave us a good insight into understanding the geometry and the potential lithological variability in the um, intake beds in these areas. If you look at the uh, image on the left, there we are. Um, that's a 3D perspective of some of the data we collected and you can really see the contrast and the geometry of one of the main artesian aquifers, the Hutton sandstone, uh, that blue band you see there and the underlying aquitard in that area, the Little Amber Formation. So it really gave us some useful information. Um, we use some of that AM data combined with some uh, compilations in combination with some new mapping done by the Office of Groundwater Impact Assessment in the Northern Surat Basin, which I pointed out there in the purple line. The GSQ did some mapping that we've incorporated into our intake bed mapping, and the New South Wales Geological Survey had uh, significantly revised the, the basin boundary in, in the south of the basin, and that's that red, red line there. Um, so this basically resulted in to, to, to some pretty significant revisions to our previous mapping that we had for the GAP, um, which we've made, we'll make available as a data set. The other component was actually trying to get a handle on how much water was entering the basin, how much water is being recharged. So we had a, had a go at doing some groundwater, uh, diffuse groundwater recharge estimation in, in collaboration with our colleagues at CSIRA. To do this, we use the chloride mass balance method. So essentially, we're looking at uh, the amount of rainfall, the chloride in the rainfall, and how that relates to the concentration of chloride in the groundwater. So rule of thumb is, I guess, in the intake beds, the lower the chloride concentration, the higher the potential recharge. So Sorrow has developed a new uh, innovative method to upscale our, our point data measurements. Um, and it also provides us that they use probabilistic modeling to give, give us a range of recharge estimates. But the benefit of this approach is that it actually accounts for geology, soils, vegetation, ET runoff uh, between what in many cases is sparse borehole data that we have. Um, but 
but the, the real real benefit is actually gives us you know spatial uncertainty estimates and assigns probabilities to the predictions. So if you look at the map on the on the right here, this is the, the output of our 50th percentile or most probable recharge rates, and you can see mostly those brown colours. So we're looking at sort of two millimetres or less across many of the basins with some high, higher areas in the north. So for the water balance, we use three estimates from the, the model output. So we use the fifth, 50th and 95th percentile um, recharge rate estimates. So we can consider them to be the min most probable max values. Um, we've got to recognise that there's limitations if you're using a chloride mass balance uh, approach. It's really quite a general uh, estimate of recharge. They're long-term averages, and they don't really take into account local variability and changes in, 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 in weather patterns in the, in the short term. In conjunction, we did some water sampling, uh, again with our colleagues at CSIRO, Matthias Matthias Raver. So um, he did some work getting existing uh, environmental and hydrochemical data together, uh, environmental trace data and hydrochemical data. Um, as well as doing some uh, new sampling. So really we're looking at trying to use this information to understand when the mood, water moves away from the intake beds into the basin, how, how that flows and, and what path that takes. So uh, Matthias, on behalf of GA, collected 16 uh, samples in the Aramanga, borehole samples, and in, in the eastern Aramanga and in the northern Strat, he did uh, sample 19 bores and five springs. In the Northern Surat, the, the, the interpretation was that um, a considerable portion of the recharge is actually rejected. So water is entering the system and then re and actually exiting um, on fairly short flow, flow paths to rivers and creeks in the vicinity of the intake beds. So we had high, high spatial variability in the results and it really highlighted, you know, as we all probably know, that you know, the complexities of the system. So there's potential aqua connectivity, lateral and vertical, and quite a lot of lithological variation that we need to take into account. So the key, key outcomes, of, I guess, of that, that recharge work was the new mapping of the intake beds, um, our improved un understanding of recharge processes, you know, what's happening when the water um, goes subsurface, uh, the aqua heterogeneity, um, combined with those new recharge estimates that we've turned into vol volumetric uh, estimates of recharge for the water balance. So a lot of the a lot of the work we've done has given us uh, insight into the processes. So we've tried to capture that groundwater recharge processes. We tried to capture that um, with some some conceptualizations of uh, recharge. Uh, on the right, we've got some examples of the simple cross sections and trying to uh, sort of communicate how we think groundwater is flowing. Um, for the uh, in the eastern Aramanga intake beds, um, the surface geology mapping shows the Ronglo beds, but um, based on the AM work, we now know that uh, much of the water is actually uh, recharging the Hutt and Sandstone aquifer, which is one of the, the main artesian aquifers in the GAB. Uh, in addition, in that, that uh, eastern Aramanga area, we, we had a look at the impacts of saprolite, uh, uh, you know, whether, whether uh, bedrock over over the top of the intake beds, and our current understanding is that it effectively works as a, a barrier to recharge, inhibiting uh, groundwater flow. Um, Northern Surat Basin, again, like we said, with a with a tracer work and some of the AM work, it really brought out the the heterogeneity in the in the aquifers, um, that recharge rejection is occurring, and that potentially we got flow compartmentalisation within within that area. Um, from whole GP, GAB's perspective, we um, looked at Nadezha's work, which he alluded to previously. So uh, her work really gave us a feel. We, we conceptualised how we can have lateral, lateral and vertical relationships across the basin between the hydrogeological units, and um, that potential increased connectivity between the eastern and central parts of the Aramanga with the western Aramanga basin. So the water balance that we did, this is um, we did a whole of GAB in the three sub basins, the Surat, Aramanga and Carpentaria. And effectively doing a water balance, we're looking at the change in storage, you know, inflow minus outflow, understanding how much water is entering the system, 
compared to how much going is going. Yeah. And like Luke pointed out, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, but if you look at that bottom left hand corner, that's a simplified conceptual idea of what we're looking at. Inflows, outflows, change in storage, looking at how much recharge is coming in, how much is being pumped out. On the right, an example of a, the, a, an accounting type approach that we took. This is a spreadsheet saying um, for the for the major active groups, the inflows and outflows. Don't worry about the numbers. It's a little bit hard to read. But the key thing is we actually used three. We came up with three separate calculations based on those min, max, and most probable recharge estimates from the CSIR modelling. So to get a feel for what what the water balance uh, calculations produce, um, we can look at this graph. So if you look at the vertical axis, that's the change in storage in gigalitres per year. Uh, the yellow line is our zero line, where, where you'd expect inflows to equal outflows. Uh, and the columns are the, the three columns on the left are the three sub basins, the Aramanga, Carpentaria, and Surat. And the large column on the right is the whole of GAB estimates. So if we look at the whole of GAB, uh, oh sorry, and, the, and the, the, the line dissecting the columns is actually the 50th percentile value. So if we look at the whole of GAB, we've got minus 21, 29 gigalitres, but the range between the min and max is, is considerable. Something we really, really, really need to take into account. Um, we just didn't use the water balance alone. We thought it's worth looking at actual water level, water levels within the base to understand what's, what's actually happening. Um, so on the right, this is some examples of some hydrographs, um, elevation and uh, groundwater head in elevation values. Um, again, don't get too bogged down in the detail there, but um, the, the red arrow is actually pointing out the um, point in time where some of these bores are rehabilitated under the capping and piping scheme. So going from uh, open bore drains in the picture on the top left to a controlled system and saving considerable amount of water. So we actually see once once those bores are capped and pop, we get this big kick in uh, increase in pressures. So I guess if we just focus on the key findings of the water balance, so um, we look again reiterating those estimated storage volumes. We've got a large range in, in values, ranges from positive to negative. Um, it really just is is pointing out the high uncertainty in, in the actual values that we've come up with. Um, as I said before, the hydrographs really show the, the benefits of the cap and pipe screen, the GABSI, and the predecessor programs. So um, another, another thing, a key finding was really that monitoring bores and hydrograph analysis repay, remains an important element of any groundwater resource assessment. You can't, there's no silver bullet, or um, there's no way of uh, replacing that type of monitoring. Um, that, those large ranges, ranges in, in, the, in the calculated water balance, we really need to do further work to constrain the uncertainty around that to bring those those um, uh, ranges down, close it uh, down. Um, but the, one of the benefits of doing the water balance, it really highlighted our lack of understanding in certain areas and where we, we can improve our estimates and will, will assist us in tar targeting future research. And that's it for me. Over to you, Luke. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, so moving on to the assessing new techniques component of the project. Um, we assess the gravity recovery and climate um, experiment, GRACE, um, for changes in mass over time. Um, we use the interferometric synthetic aperture radar, or INSA, um, for surface deformation. Um, and we assessed a modelling code um, using a Bayesian approach, um, which I'll hand over to Nadej to discuss first. Thanks, Nadej. Yep, thank you, Luke. So yes, we have uh, tried a new code in collaboration with the ANU to test a whole of gap groundwater flow modelling um, using a Bayesian approach that helped us to characterise the uncertainties associated with the model results. So after running an ensemble of models, for example, on the left-hand side, you can see um, one of the maximum uh, likelihood uh, of the water flow path estimated with uh, the average velocity within the Kanawe Ore aquifer. So this new code looks uh, promising. It's uh, very efficient using the NCI, the National Computational System, and uh, it will need further investigation to reduce some of the limitations, but also to integrate with additional hydrogeological data 
so we can better characterize the groundwater system. But um, now I'm going to hand over to Patrick to tell us more about the INSAR data. Over to you, Patrick. Oh, thanks, Nadish. Um, so just as a bit of overview of the INSAR component, uh, the purpose of this INSAR part was around the evaluation of satellite-based monitoring technology to characterize groundwater changes, uh, storage and changes. And the scope of this work we have undertaken here was to uh, firstly use INSAR technology to estimate the ground surface changes over the region of interest. And secondly, uh, investigate the correspondence between INSAR derived uh, um, ground surface changes and uh, groundwater variability. And in general, groundwater extraction induced land subsidence is mainly caused by the inelastic compaction of the fine grained um, clay layers uh, and it may also include minor amount of elastic compaction of the sand deposit. So in this project, we use a very simple pro elastic model to transfer of the ground surface velocity into equivalent water level, um, ground water level changes rate for comparison. Um, next slide, please. So for, uh, just to share with people who don't have the background, uh, we are looking at making use of a technology called interferometric synthetic aperture radar. Essentially, it's a remote sensing technique that takes repeated radar images covering the same area. And what we do is we look at phase changes between the two sets of images, and uh, um, then we can actually map the ground movement that's occurred. So in the map on right here, I'm showing uh, the example from the 2016 North Territory earthquake. You can see here is the displacement map. The ground movements that uh, have occurred when the fold has ruptured and caused the surface movements. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, in Geoscience Australia, we use an in-house software called Pirate to process all the Sentinel um, data over the Strat Basin and then estimate the vertical deformation component by doing descending and ascending decomposition. In general, we need three frames with different heading angles to figure out the 3D deformation. And, but in this case, we assume the movement in north direction is negligible, and we estimate the vertical and horizontal movement with two frames. And then GA-derived inside product is also verified with the inside product from OGIA which is produced by Otomia TRE, an uh, uh, Italian company, um, a, a pioneer in the INSA um, discipline. Two regions were also identified, which have significant subsidence signals, and a good correlation is also observed in both products. And furthermore, we transfer the INSA-derived ground motion into groundwater depletion rate by fitting a simple pro-elastic model and also compare the model to the groundwater time series data. The detailed comparison can be found in our inside report. Um, next slide, please. We then compare the inside derived ground motion with the GPS measurement. And uh, notice that there are some GPS sites that are being classified as outliers in our earlier report um, and we remove them before conducting the analysis. So this figure on the left hand side shows the accumulative distribution of GPS and inside uh, deformations. The average deformation of GPS uh, during this period of time is about minus 4.6 mil, um, whereas the inside data shows the average deformation of minus 5.6 mil. Um, a two sample t-test has been used to assess whether the two means have a statistically significant difference given that uh, the 5.4 uh, mil standard deviation of GPS measurement and uh, 9.4 mil standard deviation of the inside measurement. <clears throat> a two sample t-test show that the difference between these uh, two independent products uh, is insignificant at 5% confidence level. This means both data sets have the same average deformation over the study region. Um, and lastly, we, uh, the inside team have currently produced a ground surface motion product, which cover about 80% to 90% of the whole gap region between uh, 2016 to 2021. Uh, however, this is only the preliminary and the fundamental data set we used in GA, just like the Stripe Basin case study uh, we presented here today. 
and any localized study or comparison can be carried out with this product along with other local scale data sets, for example, the um, groundwater changes or groundwater level uh, data, that sort of things. Um, so I'm going to head him back to Luke for a uh, great discussion. Thanks. That's great. Um, thanks, Patrick. Um, so for the uh, for the Grace work that we did, um, Grace measures gravity across the globe over time, um, and this largely relates to the total um, water storage changes. Um, so what we need to do um, is to separate the groundwater storage change from this total um, water storage change. So this is quite different um, to that uh, traditional water balance approach where, um, as Tim showed, we, we added up all the components um, in, that, in that accounting. Um, in this case, um, with GRACE, uh, we get the total water storage, so we get everything all, all together, and then we need to, to subtract um, the non-groundwater sources, um, which include uh, surface water and soil moisture and, um, and, and the moisture in vegetation um, as well, um, and then after this um, subtraction, uh, this results in an estimate of um, groundwater storage change. So this um, provides an independent assessment of um, groundwater storage um, through quite a different um, way, which we can, which we can, and we did compare with the um, water balance. Um, and this was a collaboration with um, the CSIRO, the Australian National University, um, and the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, so what we're seeing here, these are the GRACE outputs of total water storage change, and they were, these were produced um, by the Australian National University, by Paul Tregoning's um, team. So what they've done is um, they've actually processed um, the satellite data for, for where, we, um, where we needed it for this project. Um, so what you can see in the left image um, is that we've aligned the outputs with the major um, basin boundaries. Um, and, and the resolution um, of this is around 300 kilometres by 300 kilometres. So this isn't um, a, a simple process and, and we've just aligned it so that we can account for the same areas that we've looked at um, with the water balance approach. And this, of course, is a, is a time series. Um, so what you can see in the image on the right um, is the results over time. Um, and we've gone for, for monthly um, uh, monthly time steps um, over the over the GRACE uh, satellite missions. Um, so what we did with these outputs is develop a workflow uh, to subtract all the non uh, groundwater components to estimate um, groundwater storage change um, in the GAB. Uh, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll go over um, the case study in the Namoy, which is that um, little spot down in the um, in the southeast um, case study um, area, that that Namoy region, um, as an example. Uh, so this work, um, this interpretive work was um, particularly in uh, collaboration with the CSIRO um, and, and Pascal um, Castellazzi was um, the principal um, researcher here um, and, and developed these new workflows um, for us to be able to um, understand what Grace, um, what Grace was telling us. So using this Nemoy uh, case study example, um, uh, the image in the left um, and what we've got, this is a time series, we've got years along the x-axis and, and the y-axis um, that's actually uh, centimetres. So, so when you look at um, centimetres, that's centimetres change in equivalent um, water height there. And what we can see um, in the in the Grace time series, um, the top um, images, top graphs A and B, is the total water um, change. We've got a number of um, Grace estimates as well as um, a, a low pass filter um, through that for the average. In graph C. Um, we've subtracted the soil moisture using um, the Aura model. Um, we did this in collaboration with the Bureau of Meteorology um, and they did some work particularly on looking um, at the uncertainty um, of these, which we were able to add um, uh, um, after the analysis. Um, and in graph D, um, this is the masking of surface water and we used um, Digital Earth Australia um, water observation uh, products, uh, which were particularly tailored um, for, the, for this project. Um, and this workflow 
results in an estimate of groundwater storage change um, in GAB aquifers over time, um, as shown in the graph uh, E there. Um, so this assessment has produced a new integrated method to remotely sense um, uh, 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 and monitor uh, groundwater. So um, similar workflows uh, were used for each of the GAB subbasins, as well as the whole GAB. Um, and these are shown in green on the on the right hand graph um, and the range in values um, uh, from the calculated uncertainties are included here um, from from all the integrated components um, and what you can see there's quite a, a large range um, uh, but just for perspective um, if you look at the at the gab which is the whole of gab um, assessment that that range from that from that center point um, to the edges is the equivalent of, of three centimeters um, difference in groundwater height um, o, o, over the gab. So it's picking up um, some fairly fine um, differences, but obviously over such a large size that that relates to um, uh, to that level of error. Um, sorry, I should say not error, um, uncertainty. So we also compared these results with the water balance results that Tim outlined. Um, so they're shown on the same graph um, in, in blue on that right hand graph. Um, and it shows that while we've calculated a wide, a wide range of uncertainty, um, considering that, that scale of the, the GAB, um, the two methods show consistency um, in the overlapping of, uh, of results. So um, an, an interesting comparison and, and further work, but we've shown um, uh, uh, an interesting comparison from very different um, techniques. So in this assessment of the new techniques, um, we've assessed um, a, a whole of GAB groundwater flow model um, uh, that's been produced and shows promising um, as a tool to better understand the groundwater system um, dynamics, such as um, velocities um, and residence times, um, and can be used into the future for um, inter-aquifer connections. Um, We've looked at, uh, we've shown that INSAR is a capable tool of monitoring groundwater changes as long as um, you have all the local data um, to assess um, those, those non groundwater um, signals. Um, and the same with BRACE, um, where it provides an independent groundwater storage change um, uh, monitoring tool um, that complements that flux based um, water balance. And um, these techniques have the potential to be used um, together as a suite of tools. So rather than one of these being um, the only monitoring technique, um, this is something where we could have an integrated um, monitoring of changes in groundwater. And these would also be used in conjunction with existing on ground uh, groundwater level and pressure uh, monitoring networks. So what we've um, what we've done is go through all the major components and um, we've had a bit of a tour um, in and out uh, of the GAB um, and sh um, shown the work that we've completed as well as um, how they fit together um, into this new updated um, work on the um, hydrogeology and groundwater recharge, um, which has improved our, um, our conceptualization and water balance of the GAB. Um, and these have been compared with assessments of new techniques. So all of these are, are improving our knowledge um, of the GAB. So the outcomes of this um, project have been um, uh, have been consistency, so drawing together consistent data sets and information for consistent basin-wide understanding of groundwater systems, and ensuring these outputs um, are available um, and accessible. Um, the new mapping of aquifers and aquitards, and not just the extents, but also um, the properties. Um, we've revised estimates of groundwater recharge, uh, including the uncertainties. Um, and this has flowed on to that updated basin water balance, um, also with uh, associated uncertainties. Um, we've assessed uh, a number of a number of new tools and, and produced um, new workflows. Um, uh, including the satellite data for um, future monitoring, and these show um, uh, to be useful for, for a, a future integration on complementary um, monitoring of groundwater. And whilst we've been doing this, we've also um, identified a number of uh, new or confirmed existing uh, data gaps and knowledge, um, which are uh, prioritised for, for future work. 
So um, this has been a summary of the project findings in this presentation, um, but the full details um, of the study can be found in our uh, 22 reports. Um, so a, a third of these are currently published and accessible, um, and the remaining reports um, will be public soon. And this is where to find uh, that that detail of um, the material that we've um, we've summarised here. Um, so the reports. Uh, uh, and these reports um, individually also outline um, knowledge gaps and future work. Um, and actually, I'll hand over to Nadej to um, to go through some of those examples of of this um, of this uh, existing and future work. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luke. So yes, building on all the work uh, completed so far in the as part of the Great Artesian Basin project. We have continued in filling data and knowledge gaps at, as part of the National Groundwater System project to uh, continue um, improving the resolution of the model, but also build, continue building on the collaboration that we have with the states and territory. So we've continued revising the stratigraphy on key boreholes across the basin, and, and we're also extending now beyond the gap to uh, reach that national uh, understanding. We are continuing also interpreting AEM data in collaboration with some uh, other uh, team within GA. We are also uh, integrating with additional seismic interpretation to uh, fill some major gaps, such as in the north, in the Gulf of Carpentaria, linking with the onshore geology, and also uh, working in collaboration with the state and territory and internal project within GA to improve the, the Western Eramanga Basin. We are also looking at integrating further with hydrogeological data so we can have a better understanding of the groundwater system. And we bring all these uh, different interpretation by using a common geological framework that help us to facilitate communication between the geoscience community, the public and policymakers. So finally, I want to really acknowledge all our collaborators that have been uh, really um, uh, successful and productive and we are looking forward to continue working together to continue improving the the resolution of the model for a long-term management of the groundwater in the gab so thank you very much everyone thank you for that fabulous presentation i think it's a a wonderful example of integration of techniques and, and ideas and also institutions to really throw everything you can at a what I said before was a national asset for for the country and it's a uh, it's made a material difference to our understanding there's no question about that and I congratulate you and it's well worth worthy of a DGAL so congratulations on your DGAL.